Good morning. Buenos dias. My name is John Luca Cueva, and as Mike said, I'm the assistant pastor in residence here. Um, my wife and I just came back from Chicago, um, and we were actually married right here in this spot by our lead pastor, Steve Gregg. Yeah. Um, if you're joining us uh, for the first time, I just want to welcome you. Um, if you're online, welcome. And uh, my wife and I, we're both, Deborah and I, we're really excited uh, to be back here in Florida, uh, where it's a little warmer in the winters. Um, and we're also excited to be here at Creekside at this church. However, we know it's been a very tumultuous year for, for many of us, for, for really all of us, um, both because of COVID and a lot of the social unrest that has been happening um, because of it and also um, not because of it. And some of us may be actually feeling that more acutely than others, but the truth is that really none of us have been able to escape um, the effects of the virus or the effects of the diseases of division or prejudice, fear or hateful rhetoric that have also spread, it would seem, both in this country and in our American church. And so similarly, the book of James is not holding back and has revealed much in our hearts and our idols. And so as a church together, we've been going through the book of James. And so this morning, I, I'd want to ask God for help because I believe that if we receive the words that James has to say for us today, it will bear much fruit in our lives. And so we need to kind of quiet that inner lawyer inside of us that kind of fights against some of those things that we hear, or we need to try and not think of that other person who really needs to hear this sermon. And so this morning, let that person be us. So let us go to our God for help. Father Nuestro, Father God, my mind is too weak. My voice is not worthy and my heart is too frail to be able to speak accurately, faithfully, fully your glorious holiness and works that you have done. And so, Father, I confess and we confess that we believe in the Holy Spirit. And so we thank you that in my and our weakness, the Holy Spirit is sufficient. And so we trust that the Holy Spirit has been working both in this congregation and through this time. So we just ask, Father, that you would let us hear from you. We want to hear from you and not from a young preacher. So would you hide me behind the cross, and would you be glorified this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. The human tongue. Jewish wisdom literature will tell us that it actually holds the power of life and death. Yet, it's only about three inches long and comprised of a couple of muscles, it's actually as unique as your fingerprint is. Fun fact. And for maybe some of our, um, in our American culture, the tongue, if you stick out your tongue, it could be seen as something of silly or even an insult. But in other cultures, for example, the Arabic culture, when you stick out your tongue, it's actually a, a sign of joy and celebration. Or the Tibetan culture, if you stick out your tongue, it's a sign of greeting or respect. Well, for me, in our Latino culture, la lengua, the tongue, is really important for us as we communicate. Well, not just because we need it to communicate, but because if you cannot roll your R's in Spanish, you cannot be understood. So thank you to my parents for making me and my brother always learn to roll our R's. Um, would have to constantly say words like ferrocarril um, or carro. Um, and even the super Latin supermarket here in Gainesville, Aurora. If you can say that, if you can say Aurora, um, I had to practice for that one. Um, so if you can say it, I'm just, just props to you. If you have nothing else to do during COVID, that's one thing you can learn. 
But more importantly, this morning, we want to hear from the Scriptures. We want to hear what James has to say about the human tongue. More importantly, our speech, be it in our mind, in our thoughts, in our words, or even digitally. So in one short sentence, I believe this is what James has for us today. This is what he is trying to tell us. The tongue is more of a priority, more powerful, and more of a problem than you and I may normally think it to be. More of a priority, more powerful, and more of a problem. And so where will James start? He starts with teachers. So look with me at verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, my sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So why teachers? Maybe in this diaspora of churches that James is speaking to, teachers were the main problem. They were the ones creating divisions through their speech, possibly. But also James is letting us know that teachers actually have a power. They have an influence in how they lead their congregations. And so James is telling us that the importance and primacy and priority that words have. And as I was looking at this text, I was trying to go through a couple different translations just to see. And actually, one of the most faithful translations I found was the NVI. It's not the NIV, it's the NVI. And if you haven't heard of it, that's okay, because it stands for Nueva Versión Internacional. So it's the NIV version, but in Spanish. And it reads plainly, No pretendan muchos de ustedes ser maestros. Rough translation, don't many of y'all aim to become teachers. <laughs> See, sometimes we hear this, and we hear it as a warning or as a suggestion from James, but actually what he's trying to say, he's, it's actually commanding all of us. There's this imperative, there's this weightiness that James is saying, don't many of y'all become teachers. Why? Well, God will judge us with more scrutiny for each word that we say. God takes words of truth seriously, words that we teach. So as a, myself, as a young pastor, I, I feel the weight of this text, and I must feel the weight of this text. But for our elders and pastors and other Christian leaders, we also need to feel the weight of this text. But for us, so what does that mean for us today? Does it mean that we have less teaching? I think the contrary. No, we need more teaching, but it's not a quantity issue. It's more of a quality issue. These past couple months, we've all been thankful and, in a way, praise God for the common grace of technology, social media, being able to hear from one another, continue to stay in relationship and community, and hear the word of God preached faithfully. However, there are also cons of technology and social media. Now, anyone with internet access or a Twitter account or a blog can be a self-proclaimed teacher. Summer of 2019, Creekside went through this series uh, through the book of Proverbs. If you haven't been able to, to listen to it, I would highly suggest it. It will bless you, especially in the midst of this pandemic we are going through. But one of the things that I took away from it was the inordinate inundation of information that we are all currently taking in. We are just taking up way too much information. And not all of it is good, and not all of it is even true. See, we are opening ourselves up to quote-unquote teachers, and we're actually being formed. We are being discipled and maybe even unknowingly. We have to try to not peddle misinformation to others because sometimes we'll hear something and then we'll turn right around and we'll tell it to someone else as if we are these professional teachers. See, thankfully, here in this church, we do have experts. We do have those who are teachers and professors and professionals in their area. And so we need to hear more from y'all. 
And we need to hear more good Bible teachers, both from men and from women, be it from books, sermons, or messages, what have you. But the problem is that we don't need less teaching. We just need more good teaching. So for all of us today, before we begin to receive information or teaching, we have to try and filter that ultimately through the word of truth. More importantly, James is trying to show us that this primacy of the tongue is not just for teachers, but for all of us. Let's look at verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, he is a complete man, mature man, able also to bridle his whole body. So I'm a, I'm a visual learner, and so when I think of someone not being able to stumble, I imagine someone not being able to stumble, like they're stumbling over their words, or maybe because it rhymes, or like fumbling. And so that's not what James is actually trying to get at here. By stumbling, he means sinning or actually going astray, going another direction that you shouldn't be. And how do we know? Well, we can make an extensive word search, but why don't we just look at the metaphors and the imagery that James provides us with? So James mentions both bits in the mouths of horses and rudders in ships. The bit in the mouth of a horse can make it stop, but it also leads the horse where it should go. And more clearly, the rudder, it does nothing but direct the ship. So our tongue actually holds primacy above our other members because it directs and it guides our lives. And I think we have seen this and experienced this in small-scale examples. Husband, have you ever before a date night maybe said something you shouldn't have had said or you regretted, and then it kind of guided the rest of the evening? No, just me? Okay. Well, that was confession. Or maybe, mothers, maybe you, you said something to your children and it kind of impacted the rest of the day. And so we, we've all said something and then it has guided our days, our times, even our years into directions that we did not intend them to go. See, the tongue for us is not the pedal, it is the steering wheel. And it doesn't matter whether we're going fast or slow, if you don't have a handle on the steering wheel, you're not going to get to your destination. So let's look at another example. Take uh, a boat. It's traveling from Miami to the Bahamas. And that's about 100 miles. And so it's two degrees off, though. So maybe over 100 miles, being two degrees off, this boat will maybe still hit the Bahamas, but maybe not the port it's trying to go. Okay. Well, what if this boat was tri- traveling from Miami to Portugal? It's in Europe. And that's 4,000 miles. So imagine if it was off two degrees to the south. Maybe if it was traveling to the Bahamas, the impact wouldn't be so much, but over the distance, of 4,000 plus miles, you can find yourself not just in another country, but in a whole other continent. You won't even be close to the destination that you were trying to go. And this is a reminder for us today as Christians that we also have a telos. We have a destination that we're traveling to. We are looking at our lives in the long distance, not the short spurts. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So today, ask yourself, where is your tongue leading you? Because it's leading you somewhere. Sometimes we allow these small, unloving words or rhetoric kind of slip into our tongues, and we say, oh, it's okay. I only say it every once in a while or when my favorite sports team loses. Or maybe when those people aren't there, I'll I'll say it. 
Well, where will that take you over the course of a couple months, over four years, over a lifetime? Maybe a little extreme, or maybe James is just using a hyperbole, but I, I think James is actually trying to reshape and reframe the way we think about our tongue. So what's so unique about the tongue that it deserves to have this primacy? Why is James choosing the tongue? Well, when most sins, is usually this it-takes-two-to-tango situation. With the tongue, no one needs to be present for you to sin. The person doesn't need to be present. Their family doesn't need to be present. Their property, their what have you. It's just you. And technology makes it even more complex now, but when you're alone, you can curse those as James will later say, and think no one hears you, but God is present. And furthermore, it's our tongue, as we know, Jesus has mentioned, it's the first thing, our thoughts or words, that reveal what is actually in our hearts. And we see this all throughout Scripture. And it should not be a surprise to us the primacy that the tongue takes, either in Proverbs or Psalms. But today, look at Ecclesiastes 5.2. Let me just read it for you. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. Jesus himself says in Matthew 15, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. Before there's ever an act, there was a thought or a word uttered by our tongue or in our heart of hearts. For the individual... Maybe perhaps there was a murderous act. There was a hate and sinful anger thought or word. Before adultery, there was a lustful thought or the objectification of someone else in word. Let's even look at it systemically. Genocide or colonization, a thought of superiority or self-seeking pride. Slavery, the complete disregard of the Imago Dei or image of God. You don't go from just one thought or word. This takes time. The tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. These are great things that one thought, one word has ultimately led to. And they are tragically great. So James is letting us know that even though the tongue is small, we should not underestimate the power it has. So now let's look at the second part of verse 5. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. So for a lot of our friends who are from the West Coast or from California, this is not so much a metaphor or an imagery. They know the real hurt and pain of forest fires. But more recently, perhaps, in Australia, we had these devastating forest fires. And if you can believe it, that actually happened this year. There were a total of 451 deaths and around 10,000 buildings destroyed. The tongue is a fire and it is powerful and destructive. And so for a moment, I just want to speak to the Creekside youth. Um, whether you consider yourself youth or not, I, I'll leave that up to you, official or unofficial. Um, but I was a, a youth assistant director, um, assistant to the director. Um, I'm just talking to the youth now. Um, and so I, I think as, as youth, y'all understand this imagery maybe better than, than most. Uh, growing up, I don't know if they still say this or not, but um, there was a saying after someone was insulted, you just got burned. 
Or you would say, do you want some ice for that burn? Um, and so it hurts when you hear someone say that to you, but there's also a little bit of James in there, I think. See, these, these hurtful remarks that you hear sometimes in school, they can feel like first-degree burns. And the reason I say that, that y'all understand it better than most is because now the tongue has gone digital. See, there's no need to be in school anymore to be able to feel these fires, these burns. We're just carrying potential fires right in our pockets, be it instant messenger, DM, or Snapchat. Maybe they can burn you through TikTok. I don't know how they do that yet, but... But a simple post that you just thought would just be... You post it, and there it goes. It can start a whole fire, depending who replies on it, who shares it, and it can go out of control. So now for, for the rest of us, uh, parents... Obviously, this is not a problem that we struggle with, right? We don't struggle with social media. Um, it's just a youth problem. Unfortunately, that's not the case. For us, as I've heard earlier this week, it is also the thumb and not the tongue. As parents, are you limiting your kids' screen time while starting wildfires on your own? See, it's easy to argue politically or what have you online or through Facebook when you can't see the other person that you may be hurting. It's become so much easier to have these conversations online, through social media, and the hateful rhetoric and the fires just begin to consume you and those around you. And we all perhaps know well the third-degree burns that 280 characters on Twitter can cause. See, James is straining here to tell us just how powerful the tongue is. If you pay attention in verse 6 alone, he uses five different adjectives. The first one, fire, which we've mentioned. And then he says, it's a world of unrighteousness. It's its own world. See, it's not picky. It, It welcomes all. Prejudice, you're welcome. Anger, come on in. Gossip, welcome back. The tongue is not picky. It stains our whole body. It may start in your tongue, but then it leads your feet to somewhere you actually don't want to be or makes your hands do something that you never intended them to. And it sets the entire course of life on fire Maybe some of us can remember when we were young, the bullying comments we received, or through high school, the rejections, college, the criticism, or now, older, the things that we say that hurt others that we regret. And it is set on fire by hell. It has the power of Satan himself, the old serpent and father of lies, who has been deceiving since the beginning. And as a matter of fact, James himself, in verse 7, if you see, takes it all the way back to creation. He says, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. See, God in creation gave us dominion over all of creation, over all animals. But no one, as James says in verse 8, no human, no human can control the tongue. See, maybe Joe Exotic in the Netflix documentary can control a 400-pound tiger, but he can't control his tongue. And I shouldn't judge him too much because I can't control a 400-pound tiger or my tongue. And the tongue, it's, it's restless. And in our culture today, this is fertile ground because our culture is restless. We can't stand still in silence or be away from our phones for more than an hour. And in that, this poison spreads. And if you haven't felt it enough yet, that's not even the real problem James is trying to get out today. So let's look at verse 10. 
From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, my sisters, these things ought not be so. James is now speaking directly to the churches, speaking directly to us as Christians, as believers. These are hard words, words of correction. These ought not be. But also notice the repetition of my, my brothers, my sisters. This is tender and pastoral. See, James isn't just sitting high and judging. He is correcting, but he is coming towards you with love and tenderness in his heart because he knows this is not good for the churches to do so. Verse 10, from the same mouth come blessings and cursings. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? So for me, this is, this is helpful to think in, in imagery. Growing up, I had a, a mango tree in my backyard, and I, I, love, I love mangoes. Don't love picking up mangoes uh, during season as much, but I do love mangoes. And so imagine if you had a, a, a Florida mango tree, and it's producing mangoes, but also Michigan apples. That would be really weird, wouldn't it? And so I think with this, James is trying to tell us, Can you have both fresh and salt water from the same source? Can you have both Florida mangoes and Michigan apples from the same tree? Can this be so with us? He goes even further. He says, can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So he's saying that this mango tree is now only producing Michigan apples, you can't even recognize it as a mango tree anymore by its fruit. And so as I hear that, I ask myself, can people still recognize us by our fruit? In the midst of COVID, social injustices and unrest, are we sounding more like idols that we worship? Are we sounding more like news anchors than children of God? We must bear fruit that is according to the roots that we are grounded in. And so as we close and as we think practically what to do this week, um, I thought of this expression, this American proverb I heard growing up, and if you know it, you can say it with me. Sticks and stones may, but words. Isn't that a lie? Uh, thankfully, by God's grace and, and good medicine, our, our bones, our bodies will heal over time. But there are definitely words that I have heard, perhaps that you have heard, that have found that innermost core and parts of who we are and have hurt us so deeply that we still remember them and we are still wounded by them. And so for, for us as Christians, James has made it very clear that we cannot control our tongue. But the African church father, Augustine of Hippo, does, does help us with this. Please look with me again at verse 8. We're not just splitting hairs here. This is the word of God. It says, but no human being can tame the tongue. No anthropos, no man, nor woman. And so it leaves us hope that there is one who can tame the tongue. It is the one who only said the words that the Father would speak to him. It is the one who cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It is Jesus Christ, our Lord.
Amen. And so we as Christians have heard these words. As there are words that hurt, there are words that heal. These are gospel truths, words from God that heal our hearts. And if we would surrender to the Spirit, let us be controlled by God, fill ourselves with words of truth, we can then be conduits of this healing and grace to a broken and divided world that desperately needs to hear this. And for any non-Christians, or maybe you're hearing this and you can resonate with painful words, maybe spoken by another brother or sister, or sorry, maybe family member or what have you, those close to you, know that our God speaks words of repentance, of love, mercy, and grace to you. And if you'd like to hear more about that, I know myself and any of the other pastors would would love to talk to you about it. So let us go into a word of prayer. Father God, I am a person of unclean lips, and I and we dwell among people of unclean lips. We give you thanks for the grace and the refining and sanctifying spirit that you have sealed us with. We ask, Father, that we would continue to surrender to the one who can control our tongue and our thoughts. Help us as a church to be known by the fruit that we bear according to your righteousness, not of our own. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.